everyone. My name is Danielle Solish. And my name is Iman Chaudhry, and you're listening to the fourth episode of Seeing Clearly, a pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. On today's episode, we'll be interviewing Dr. Celia Amrani. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today. So a little bit about Dr. Celia Amrani. So Celia completed a Bachelor of Applied Science in Biomedical and Mechanical Engineering at University of Ottawa. She then went on to complete a Master's of Engineering at McGill University in the BBME, Biological and Biomedical Engineering, specializing specifically in microfluidics. Dr. Amrani then completed her medical school at the University of Ottawa through the French Stream, and she has just begun her residency as a PGY1 at Queen's University in Ophthalmology. So without further ado, we'd like to introduce our guest for this episode, Dr. Celia Amrani. Um, so I guess we'll just get started with um, a general question. Uh, we know that your journey in ophthalmology kind of just got started, but do you mind talking a little bit about what drew you to the field and whether or not there were other specialties that you were interested in as you were going through medical school? Yeah, of course. Um, I think like every journey, mine was certainly not linear. Um, actually, as a child, and it's very funny, uh, I suffered from um, um, a high, myop high myopia and also ambilopia as a child. And my ophthalmologist certainly had a predominant position in my life growing up, regular checkups and whatnot. And um, I think that kind of started the whole um, trust I have with ophthalmologists and the um, the way I regard them um, was always, you know, very high, and uh, they, were, they did have a big um, influence in my life growing up. Um, but when I started medical school, um, I had the plan to become an orthopedic surgeon, actually, um, because of my background in biomedical mechanical engineering, design of artificial prosthesis and implants and whatnot. You know, I just wanted to to get my hands dirty and actually be the surgeon that that gets to implement those prosthesis to follow the patients and whatnot. Um, but throughout my first couple of years in CBLs and just working through diagnoses and, and just learning about medicine, I, I guess my interests have, have evolved and, and that's part of the reasons why I kind of wanted to trust my journey and also keep my options wide open and not necessarily focus on orthopedic surgery. And I think I grew from that experience and learned a lot, but it's only really through third year that I actually I got interested in ophthalmology. I certainly did love the ophthalmology unit that we have um, a second year, I believe, in Ottawa, and it was great. But I would be lying if I told you that, you know, just with one week of courses, that's it. I found my life's passion, no regrets, and ophthalmology was going to be it for me for the rest of my life. I don't think that would be true. Um, I think it put ophthalmology on a map, and it was kind of in the back of my mind. But through my elective in third year, I think... I just couldn't overlook that ophthalmology was a great fit and it became a calling very, very quickly. And uh, from that point on, and it's actually pretty late. So if you talk usually to um, future ophthalmologists or residents, they'll tell you that they decide ophthalmology you know, to, during the first couple of years. But for me, it was uh, midway through third year. So, I mean, it's a way to give all of you hope that it's never too late to follow what you truly believe in and your passions. And if ophthalmology is for you, then I hope ophthalmology would choose you as well. Thank you for sharing that. I think that your path and the way that like you didn't know right off the bat that you wanted ophthalmology just goes to show that there are so many different routes that ophthalmologists take in order to like reach their goals and, you know, go into this specific residency, which I think will be great for all our listeners to hear. So thank you for sharing that. Um, just a question um, beyond this, just about beyond the field of ophthalmology, but were you involved in any research during medical school? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So yeah, I touched a, a bit about how I started thinking about orthopedic surgery. And then actually my interest evolved beyond that and actually got interested more in medicine and internal medicine. Um, but always with a focus on biomedical engineering. And so if you look through my publications and my interests, they're, they're varied. I have publications and, and research at the Heart Institute in cardiology, um, mainly um, analyzing trans echocardiogram and developing algorithm to be able to measure the flow at the end of um, ventricles. So very um, highly, I guess, engineering applications. Uh, also in the field of cardiothoracic surgery slash material science, 
uh, developing different kinds of sutures that are bi biodegradable, so testing those mechanical properties. So you see a bit of engineering, but also medicine. And I, only, I always just trusted my instincts in terms of just being involved in the, in the research projects that interest you, mm -hmm. and then use that, I guess, as a starting point to figure out what you want and what specialty interests you, instead of doing the opposite, um, which, is, which is what I think most students do. So they would just randomly, not randomly, but just decide on a specialty and then try to build their CV. It's, it's, it works, I'm sure it does. But if in order to be a more genuine balanced person, you kind of have to, to go the other way and just take a hard look at yourself, at your passions, at what you're good at, and then follow those research opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it started in material science and in engineering and in internal medicine. And then I got involved almost as a fluke, I guess, in medical education and in qualitative data, data analysis. So as an engineer, you know, I was tasked with analyzing words and patterns using the software, and it was very daunting, but also very exciting. So uh, we use that in order to um, modify the curriculum for simulated patients at the University of Ottawa, and then later on got also invested in projects that treat or touch on the diversity of medical students at the University of Ottawa, and being from a minority background, it was also very important to me. So you'll see that I always stay true to who I am and to my passions. And then actually during CARMS, I was also involved in the design of an escape game for family medicine. I had absolutely no interest in family medicine, but designing an escape game was, was fantastic. It touched on quality improvement and also on the cooperation between medicine and engineering. And um, I, I will tell you that after I kind of set, set myself on doing ophthalmology, I did get involved in, in uh, ophthalmology research. That's true, mainly because it was a great work, way to network, but also consolidate my interest in ophthalmology. Uh, but um, I mean, it's it's I didn't get any publications from that yet, um, and it just show you that you just have to follow your research interests and and be balanced in that way. And um, it's having research or publications in ophthalmology is by no way like a sine qua non condition in order to get to get accepted or get interviews or anything like that. Wow, I mean, that's amazing that you were involved in so much and in such a wide variety of specialties and fields in medicine. It really shows, you know, the two of us and also our listeners that if you do do what you're passionate about, just like you kind of did along your whole journey, um, you'll end up where you're, where you're meant to be and where you're happiest. And so kind of on that note, for those who realize that they are interested in ophthalmology and do um, have an interest in research as well. Do you have any advice in terms of getting into research and, um, you know, specifically in the field of ophthalmology or elsewhere for that matter, if that's what they're passionate about? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, networking is very important. Um, I think most of my research opportunities came from my preceptors or residents I've worked with or, or did other research with. And it's the best way really to, to hear about research projects that interest you and, and kind of talking to them. They see that you're interested in it. And then so they give you the project kind of thing because everyone is qualified or not qualified anyways to do that research project. And it's all about building that trust between you two. Um, there are other ways to do that. I mean, interest groups um, uh, in any medical school, I'm sure uh, kind of publishes some, uh, some research uh, topics that became available, uh, OIG, so the Ophthalmology Interest Group also kind of um, display or publishes or I guess um, disseminates some of these research projects that might become available. Uh, I've also seen uh, during my fourth year elective, third year medical students get research projects just by talking to residents in ophthalmology. Um, um, I'm sure every resident is is very busy and sometimes just having a medical student to help them get that project out and published is always helpful. Um, and, um, and yeah, just stay tuned to, to these. Um, I'm actually also looking for help for a research project and um, I'm actually recruiting one or two pre-clerk um, medical students, data mining, um, statistical analysis and whatnot uh, in ophthalmology. So uh, feel free to leave me a message at my Ottawa email. Uh, you can find me probably in the directory. It's uh, um, Samara, S-A-M-R-A 050 at uottawa.ca. And I'm looking for medical students um, in a project in neuro-ophthalmology. Um, and so you see, just like that, you have opportunities. Obviously, they're limited, but just by showing interest, you can, um, you can find something that, that's suitable for you for sure. 
For sure. And thank you for even giving our listeners and everyone who is able to like even watch this video or listen to the podcast an opportunity like that. It just shows that when you make a connection, it's important to hear out any research opportunity you can get. And for all our listeners, we'll make sure to um, paste Dr. Amrani's uh, email in the like the biography of the actual podcast so that you guys can get in contact if any of you are actually interested in the research opportunity within neuro-ophthalmology uh, doing the um, biostatistics. So thank you so much for sharing that. And then question getting a little bit away from research now is were you involved in anything else in medical school besides just research? Yeah, it's, it's a very important question. I mean, um, we're all different. Some people chose to get more involved in interest groups or volunteering or whatnot. I think the bulk of my time honestly went into research just because I had a tremendous amount of research in many different fields. I was also actually finishing up my master's um, and my, defending my thesis uh, midway through I guess, in the beginning of first year. Um, but I also was involved in um, a lot of volunteering op opportunities. The most important one actually was during COVID itself. So for three months, I worked as a, um, a frontline worker um, in a Salvation Army. So I was working in an isolation unit and I had a number of people in my charge and I was trying to, to work full time and then part time and also attending classes. Um, so just uh, that's, that's, that's already something. Um, I was also uh, involved um, at the um, iExplore uh, conference. So it's a medical student-led conference in ophthalmology. Uh, and uh, it was a pleasure to, um, to be involved in that conference and, and recruit residents to present at the conference um, and basically disseminate ophthalmology um, um, to anyone who was interested in it, uh, medical students uh, from you know, first or fourth year. And that was uh, very interesting. Uh, but yeah, I would say that that was my main um, kind of works uh, during my uh, clerkship. I was also I was also writing the USMLE. So that took a lot, a lot, a lot of time, to be honest, step one and step two. That's that was something. Um, but no, I wasn't really I'm not your typical applicant in terms of, you know, wanting ophthalmology from day one and then kind of building my CV towards ophthalmology. I was really trying to stay true to myself, get involved in research projects that defined who I am as an engineer, as a medical student. And I was lucky because actually pursuing medicine, I couldn't, I was struggling to find projects that were both medicine and engineering until I found ophthalmology. And finally, I found a specialty that kind of combines the both for me and it saves me a lot of time. Um, but yeah, so honestly, um, just get involved in what you're passionate about. If it's leading an interest group, doing volunteering or doing research, then just be who you are. Wow. So again, I mean, definitely seems like you kept yourself busy uh, during medical school and, and will continue to do that uh, during your residency. But um, halfway through medical school, I guess, we kind of entered this new COVID phase. Um, and it seems like you still found stuff to, to get involved with and things that you were passionate about. So do you mind maybe talking a little bit about how you navigated completing and obtaining new extracurriculars during COVID, um, like research or like um, your volunteer positions? Yeah, I guess COVID uh, for me hit midway through third year, which was, I guess, crucial for me because it gave me um, much needed, the really important and much needed time for me to be able to pursue ophthalmology. Because if it weren't for COVID, um, I don't think I would have had enough time to find research opportunities, to complete research projects, to network as much as I did. So I, I'm pretty sure that um, I owe my, <laughs> you know, my uh, my presence as a, a, an ophthalmology resident to COVID actually. And, and I'm thankful for that. Obviously it's a global pandemic and, <laughs> and whatnot, but just, <laughs> I guess I, I tend to see the silver lining in all things. And uh, what I did, I mean, I, I uh, answered the call for help from inner city Ottawa that we're looking for um, frontline workers because that was important for me to get involved and honestly just staying home and, and doing nothing wasn't for me anyways. But it also gave me the time to kind of build my CV, update my CV, and then just, um, I guess, go through the directory and look for research opportunities. So I send my CVs to 
pretty much, I, I believe, all the staff of the I Institute uh, looking for research opportunities or whatnot. And, and I got some answers back. So it shows you that it actually works. I got involved with Dr. Brakey and this research project that I'm recruiting for, but also with Precision Cornea Clinic and Dr. Baig, uh, who's also a Miguel alumni. And, and basically, we, we started working together. Uh, we're working on a literature review that studies different types of um, iris implants. Um, and that's really interesting. But then this connection also stayed during my fourth year because not only did he write me a letter, but he also um, accepted to have me as a research um, as a research elective student and also shadow in the clinic and and in the OR and everything I guess happens for a reason and um, I guess for me I just chose to see that as an opportunity rather than seeing it that you know it's just oh COVID you know I can, I can do as many electives. I, I'm not able to, to be in the OR, to shadow whatnot, but just see what it can bring to my life. And the words stood still for, for a moment and I used it to my advantage. And that's incredible because I think, especially as medical students, sometimes we struggle, especially knowing with everything going on in the pandemic, it's hard to get some opportunities, hard to be in person and like, to, you know, to take that silver lining, finding the time and taking that extra time to reach out and like really get as many connections as you can. I think that shows that like every medical student can go ahead and do that because honestly, there are tons of opportunities now that people are at home. There's more like grand rounds online. There's more, you know, just a ton of opportunities to like get involved just like virtually and like from, from home and, and that's incredible. Um, so on the same vein, do you have any advice or any upcoming medical students who are going to be now or soon going through the CARMS process? Mm -hmm. And I mean, your situation, we're, we're kind of in the same situation, but just because for you guys, COVID kind of happened during your pre-clerk years, I guess the rules of, of the game for you is a bit different because for us, we still got enough, I guess, shadowing opportunities. We still, some of us already, I mean, I did, I got, got my off to elective before COVID hit. So I had a little bit of exposure and um, the certainty that off to was for me, but for those of you uh, who don't have that many opportunities, I can, I mean, you certainly cannot just go at the eye institute or uh, whichever uh, hospital or eye clinic that you want and just shadow and um, I guess confirm the ophthalmologies for your network and whatnot. But again, I think what you have to remember is that everybody is in the same situation as you. Everyone applying for your year is pretty much has the same cards in mm -hmm. their hands that you do. And that's very, very important because the mindset is key. Speaking from someone who decided on opto probably, you know, <laughs> latest from of the like cohort, this is what you need to see this as your uh, basically as an advantage um, because everyone is in the same game. Mm -hmm. Now, opto is a bit different because you're also competing against research fellows, and those, frankly, are not really your competition. They have experience, they are known in their hospital, they have the networks that you don't have. Um, so basically focus on the other students, <laughs> the regular students, and just realize that they have the same cards as you do. They have the same tools as you do. It's just a matter of using those tools to the best of your advantage. And also, again, staying true to who you are, because that would make a difference. If you're trying to be someone that, that you're not or project an air of false confidence or whatnot, um, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna happen and people are gonna see through it and it's probably gonna upset a lot of people. And so in that sense, what I would say is use this to our advantage as a pre clerk student, everything is online. So maybe you don't go to class, you spend more time home, or guess what? There are a lot of research banks, a lot of great off the books and off the um, reading materials. I can suggest some, and you can use this to maybe be a better clerk than I was in terms of maybe you have more time to read and you can actually read those materials and be maybe more knowledgeable than than the rest of us who basically didn't have as much time to study and we kind of just studied as we went through and maybe we didn't answer as many questions. And yes, we don't have to have all the questions or all the answers to the questions, but maybe use this to our advantage. Maybe uh, the preceptors would be surprised how much you know, how much you have researched, how many articles you have read. So we use this to our advantage in that sense. Um, you also have more time at home, so maybe more time to do research projects to you know, um, create those wonderful podcasts. So yeah, I think that's, that's what you have to keep in mind. I think 50% of the game is also inside your head and meant a mental game. And don't get discouraged. Every day, just set yourself a goal and make it that it's one step further to what you want to accomplish. And, and hopefully, you know, that would be getting into Afto. 
Well, thank you for uh, all of your positive outlooks on every possible situation we've kind of thrown at you there. I think it's extremely helpful for me to hear how you kind of spin every situation into a positive light. And I'm, I hope it's helpful for uh, all of our listeners as well, because I think with an attitude like that, um, no matter what you set your mind to, you could be successful. So kind of along the same lines, um, I know one difficult part about COVID and the CARMS process is, you know, only kind of being able to network and feel like you're only making connections at your home school. Um, but do you have any advice or can you speak a little bit about what it was like to navigate the process um, in terms of networking at other schools and applying to other schools? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And it's a source of a lot of anxiety amongst, um, you know, everyone going through the CARMS process. Again, you're not you're not the only one who has to go through that. And if it wasn't if it wasn't possible to to kind of get the word out there or to shine in other faculties, well, then we would just all mash to their, our homeschool, which didn't happen. So it shows you that there is a way to actually um, get yourself known. Um, I can only, I guess, speak to myself. Um, what I did usually, and I remember what happened is, you know, I, as I was doing my other uh, core electives in third and fourth year, you know, I would just tell them, hey, I'm Celia, um, you know, yes, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in this rotation, but I'm actually applying in this. And then they would tell me, oh, okay, well, I have this friend who also mashed into, it was actually Queens Ofto. Her name is Allison. She's really great. This is her email. Should I give her a call? And just doing that, and I did that for BC and other schools, um, talking to those residents, I think, gave me uh, some answers, some much needed answers, because I didn't do my electives there, because I didn't know really how the program was, even through the, the socials and et cetera. But I would be lying if I said that, you know, this is basically what decided me matching into specialty A, B, or C. Not really. It's more about get, getting information, maybe getting um, your feet wet in terms of getting to know other residents um, amongst other programs. Um, so I guess I, in that sense, um, it's difficult. Um, mm -hmm. What happened actually, but I guess it's a special situation. I actually met one of the um, staff uh, at Queens at the Eye Institute in Ottawa because he was um, just um, subbing for uh, someone who wasn't there that day. And actually, you know, he told me that, you know, I was doing a great job. And then he would recommend me to X, Y, and Z and talk about me kind of thing because he thought I would be a great fit. So it was completely incidental. I didn't plan any of it. I just, you know, did my job, try to, to be the best clerk that I could, um, be optimistic, talk to the staff, talk to the residents. And, you know, those opportunities happen and you can't control them. Um, and I don't think you can actually um, you can actually create those opportunities yourself. But maybe if you start early and you're looking for research projects, um, then maybe you can actually form those connections with those people because you're not really in a situation where you can just let's say travel to Toronto and do an elective or do some research. But maybe sending your emails to people all around Canada um, in a field maybe that you're interested in or something like that, then maybe they will get to know you. So that would be uh, one way to do that. Thank you for that advice. I think that one thing I really took away from that is it's just very important to not be afraid to reach out to individuals in the field. Everyone seems like they want to help or mentor someone else. And it seems like this chain that continues to pass on. And I think that's extremely important to know um, especially in the world of COVID where you not, might not be able to have these traveling electives, you know, to just make these connections as much as you possibly can. So thank you. And thank you for answering all of those questions in general. That essentially wraps up all the questions that we had about the field of ophthalmology and about your experiences in med school and just starting residency. And to finish off, we tend to do um, this thing with all of our guests where we do one or two would you rather questions just to get to know you on a little bit more of a personal level, taking a step back. So um, I'm going to go ahead and begin with the first question yeah. and then Iman will take over for the second. Um, so our first question is, would you rather be extremely allergic to your favorite food or eat your least favorite food once a week? Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, my favorite food is sushi. I'm not even sure it's a food. So I definitely would not be able to live without eating sushi at least like three times a week. <laughs> um, being allergic would just kill me essentially. <laughs> um, 
So I guess I would say um, option B, because I try to eat healthy and in doing so I, I eat very healthy food that I do not particularly like, <laughs> like um, broccoli or celery or whatnot. <laughs> Just it shows that, you know, uh, so I would say B, because if you want to be healthy, sometimes you have to eat things that are good for you, but that you don't necessarily appreciate. <laughs> Fair enough. That makes sense. And then for our second question, um, would you rather have the ability to see 10 minutes into the future or to see 150 years into the future? Oh, interesting. Um, I would say uh, I would say 10 minutes <laughs> uh, because I guess, um, first of all, uh, I haven't started operating yet, but you know, in 10 minutes, you can, if you're quick, you can be done <laughs> for cataract surgery and uh, some other <laughs> after procedures. And it would be good to know if there would be a success or if there would be any complications. Um, and uh, whereas knowing things 150 years in the future is a little bit that like that, um, Greek a goddess, uh, basically uh, she could see in the future, but she were, she was cursed in a way that no one would believe what she was telling people. And therefore mm -hmm. she actually went mad <laughs> because being able to see the future and not being able to convince people about what was gonna happen and try to, I guess, change the course of thing or the path of humanity is extremely frustrating. And I think it would just drive you mad knowing that we might be doing something wrong. and just me as, as one humble, unique person, I wouldn't need to change it. <laughs> so I think 10 minutes is enough. <laughs> and it will also, I guess, <laughs> help me, you know, sometimes you just uh, drop something by mistake or whatever. I would just be able to predict that and avoid very embarrassing situations sometimes. Um, like, you know, putting a dialing eye drop <laughs> uh, instead of like alkane and then having to explain why the pupils of the patient is like dilated and having to admit that I didn't get the right drop in see so I would have liked to know 10 minutes in advance that do not use this drop you're gonna make a fool of yourself <laughs> yeah, you could just pause what you're doing look 10 minutes ahead and see if you made a mistake or not yeah exactly yeah. I love the logic <laughs> well thank you for answering those uh would you rather questions for us and also thank you to everyone for listening to this episode of Seeing Clearly, which is our fourth episode. And thank you so much to Dr. Celia Amrani for coming and joining us on today's podcast. Um, this was incredibly useful for Iman and myself, but also for all of our listeners, especially you've just started residency. So taking the time in order to do this, we really appreciate. Um, for everyone else, again, a reminder that Seeing Clearly is a pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. And so you can stay caught up with us on the podcast, but also can check out our website, www.icurriculum.com and follow us on Instagram at iCurriculum. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Amrani. Thank you, Iman, and thank you, Danielle. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.